Welcome to Fading Memories, a podcast with advice, wisdom, and hope from caregivers who have lived the experience and survived to tell the tale. Think of us as your caregiver best friend. Welcome back, Fading Memories listeners. Thank you so much for choosing us today. Back with me again is Cameron Huddleston. She was a caregiver for her mom for 12 years, but you may also know her from the episode, uh, Show Me the Money, what, based on her book, Mom, Dad, We Need to Talk, it's all about how to talk to your parents about their finances. So if you haven't heard that one, it'll be linked in the episode notes. But today we are discussing how to choose memory care without feeling guilty. So thanks for joining me, Cameron. Thank you so much for having me. You're welcome. So the 12 years you were caring for your mom, did she ever live with you? She did. So the first two years after her diagnosis, and she was 65 when she was, she was diagnosed, she was living on her own too. So the first two years, she continued to live independently, but I did bring in someone to drive for her so she could run errands. Didn't want her to get in any accidents. And then for two years, she lived with me and my family. And I did actually have paid caregivers helping her during the day while I worked, but I was the one in the morning who would take her medicine to her and make sure she was eating breakfast in the evenings. She would, again, I would be giving her medicine. She would eat dinner with us. I took care of her on the weekends while also raising two young kids. And then I added a third one into the mix. And then when it got, oh, what was I thinking? Um, <laughs> and then it just, when it got to the point, and we can talk about this more, when I realized she needed more care than what I could provide, she needed a safer environment. That's when I decided to start looking into memory care facilities and found one. And she ended up living in um, actually two different memory care facilities for a total of eight years. It was a very long time. It's a very we long time. Yes. I thought my mom was going to be living in memory care for a decade because we moved her to memory care at 74. She walked, no aids, spoke most of the time for the first couple of years, two and a half years, maybe English sentences that made sense. And then it was English words that sounded like sentences with no context. So it, it made sense if you knew what she was talking about, but it was hard to figure out what she was talking about. And then, as you probably remember, she broke her leg, and that was the end of that, which um, we can get into as well, because she was basically resisting the care staff that was there, and they were fantastic. But I think we need, we need to have some sort of, um, what is the right word? <laughs> we need to have people coming together to help change that industry, because... The staff doesn't get paid well. It's very, very expensive for families, so it's out of reach for many people. So we'll get to that later. So your mom had early onset Alzheimer's like mine. Yes. And how did you make the decision? Well, let's see. You kept her at home for as long as you could, which is what everybody says they want. And was she resistant to the person that you brought in to help her? I guess it was just a driver. Well, initially, yes, I had hired a college student when she was still living in her own house. And then actually, um, one of her friends introduced me to a woman who was closer to my mom's age, who had had a lot of experience working in adult daycare. And so she took over that role. And that was a better fit because it was like my mom was hanging out with a friend. And so did that for a while. But after my mom got a scam call one day and actually I got a call from my uncle because she had reached out to him asking him how to wire money. And he's like, I think your mom is being taken advantage of. And so I went over to her house and someone had been calling saying that she'd won a prize and she had to pay a fee to collect the prize. She needed to wire money. I'm like, no mom, this is a scam. Um, but it didn't matter how many times I told her that it wasn't, it just wasn't sinking in. It wasn't processing because she had Alzheimer's disease and 
that certainly affects your financial decision-making ability. It it affects any decision-making ability. And so (laughs) I had to sit with her and fend off those calls for an entire day until I got to the point where I had to go pick up my kids from school. And I called in one of her friends to come sit with her because I didn't want her to get back on that phone and be talked into handing over her money to the scammer. And that was a wake up call for me. I was like, you know, she can't be unsupervised anymore. And also her house was a two-story home. It was getting more and more difficult for her to maintain it. My husband was the one who was coming over and mowing her grass for her, taking care of her lawn. She was not cleaning her house the way she used to keep it clean. And there were just, there were a lot of issues and I wanted to be proactive. So that's when I decided it would be better for her to be in my house. And I was lucky because we had a large home with two apartments in it that we were renting out and someone had just moved out of an apartment. I could move her into an apartment. She would have her own space. She, and I was like, mom, I I really sold this to her. Like, mom, you'll get to be with your grandkids more. You can help me in the garden. You'll have your own balcony. You can put flowers out there because she was really into gardening. But I could keep an eye on her. I could make sure she was taking that medicine. I could make sure she was eating her meals. And like I said, I had to hire someone though to keep an eye on her during the day um, because she wasn't really capable of making her own meals at that point. She could still get around. She could still be social, but she had lost the ability to really care for herself in the way that she needed to be cared for. And so we did that, like I said, for two years. and. Then because her apartment was above my bedroom, I oh, started dear. hearing, I could hear her walking around at night and that scared me. And, and, you know, this happens with people who have Alzheimer's disease, mm-hmm. their sleep patterns are disrupted. So I could hear her walking around. She left a kettle on the stove and left the apartment had come downstairs. She was with us. And then I had some family over. And so she took them upstairs to show her, show them her apartment. And they discovered and the kettle was left on the stove and I'm like, oh my gosh, almost burned down the house. So there were, there were several of these incidents where it made me realize again, once again, this situation isn't necessarily working out. And I was worried, what if she wanders off at night? What if she, because she was on a second floor, she could still move just fine. She could get up and down those stairs. But what if it's nighttime? What if she falls down those stairs? What if she wanders off and gets lost? And I didn't want to be getting a call from the police in the middle of the night telling me that they had found my mom lost and wandering around town. And so I started looking into facilities and there was not a memory care facility in the city where we live. There were assisted living facilities, but assisted living facilities don't provide the level level of care that people with memory issues need. You've got to have someone there who is giving them those medication reminders. It's got to be a facility set up where they can't get lost. You know, there's Mm got to be someone who's coming in and making sure they're getting dressed in the morning. Someone who's helping with bathing because people with memory issues, they become resistant to bathing. (laughs) It's an issue. It's a big issue. You know, someone who, you know, people who are making meals for her. And so I had to find a facility actually in another city. And I, I just did the research on my own and came back to my mom and I had conversations with her and said, mom, I think you need to be in a place that's safer for you. And we'd have these conversations, but she would forget, of course. And I felt terrible that I was the one making these decisions for her, but I tried to look for a place that would, you know, meet her standards. And, and, you know, honestly, it was harder to move her into my house than to move her into a memory care facility. Because when I moved her into that facility, I, um, you know, with the help of some other family members, We took some of her furniture, so it still looked like her own place, and got her in there. And she kind of looked around, and she looked at me, and she said, okay, so I'm living here now? And I was like, yes. And it went smoothly. And I knew that for her, it was good, because she could still be social. They had activities, and um, she wouldn't be isolated, and there were going to be people there who could watch her at all times. And then once a facility opened up closer to where I lived, I moved her back. In my town. And of course that made things a lot easier. But at that point, she, she had no awareness of where she was. So she didn't even realize she was being moved from one facility to another. Which is usually really tough. So what kind of advice would you give people who feel 
and and probably rightly so that they need to move their loved one, their parent in to their home with them. Like what should they be aware of? What, you know, like what sometimes people do it, they do it out of love. <clears throat> Excuse me. They do it out of love and they, I don't think they're, I don't think we're quite prepared like we need to be because nobody tells you what you need to do to parent proof your house, <laughs> but they do tell you what to do to baby proof your house. Exactly. But it's similar, really. You've got to make sure that, you know, there aren't medications that your parents shouldn't be getting into. Um, you've got to make sure that, you know, if there are stairs that your parents still able to get up and down those stairs or put your parent on a first floor bedroom so that your parent isn't going up and down stairs and having that baby gate so that your parent can't go up the stairs and fall. You need to have a bathroom that's accessible. You know, so this might mean making some changes to your house, you know, and more than anything, you, if you're married or you have a partner, you've got to have conversations with your partner. You can't just come home and announce one day, Hey, I'm moving mom in with us. I'm moving dad in with us. Cause that's going to create a lot of stress in your own relationship. If you have kids, you know, the kids need to be aware. It's not their decision to make, but they need to be aware of what's going on. They need to, you need to have conversations with them to let them know what's going on and why you're bringing that parent into the home. And, you know, in that regard, it can be wonderful. It can give, you know, your children a great opportunity to have a relationship with a grandparent and, and, and develop that connection and that bond. But you also have to let them know if there is memory loss, you know, grandma's going to ask you questions and she's going to ask you again and you can't get frustrated. You just answer them. You just keep answering those questions again and again and again. You need to expect this. I mean, I coach my kids on this sort of thing all of the time, um, you know, but it's it is it's not easy. It's not easy. It takes it takes preparation. It takes planning. And I think if you're going to do it, you want to sell your parent on the benefits. You don't want to make your parent feel like you're taking away your parents' freedom and independence, which you are, but mm -hmm. you don't want your parent to feel that way. And so you, if you can give your parent his own space or her own space, if you can allow your parent to still feel like your parent is playing a role in the family, you know, maybe like telling your parent, hey, I'd love for you to come in and move with me to help me keep an eye on the kids. Maybe that's not your goal at all, but you're, you're, you're advertising it as such that your parent feels like your parent still has a role to play and you're helping prevent that role reversal. Um, because it will, it will increasingly become a role reversal. You have to become a parent to that parent. And that's where, where that tension really arises. And that's, I hated that. Like I hated being, a parent to my parents, you've got to be really careful with all those interactions and think about how you're approaching your parent and how you're talking to your parent. You don't want to talk down to your parent, even though you can see that your parent needs your help. The, if you're condescending, if you're talking down to your parent, your parent's going to resist your efforts. And so you've got to, you know, it's like when you're dealing with a toddler, distract. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Don't don't try to get into that argument with a toddler. It's you're not gonna win. Yeah, you will totally lose that one. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be the temper tantrum and the same thing. You know, if you have a parent who's experiencing any sort of memory loss, you know, it's just distract, distract, or give them other tasks to be involved with. Help them continue to feel relevant and and useful. But um, you know, I know people often think, you know, the parents say, Don't ever move me, don't ever put me in a home, like a nursing home. Don't ever you know, I want my family to take care of me. And when that pressure is put on you, it's really difficult. And I think a lot of people think, well, moving them into my house is the best alternative. They don't want to be put into a nursing home. I'll move them into my house. Um, it's but not always. No. My <laughs> paternal grandmother was the same way. She had money. She could have bought herself an apartment in an assisted living community. And I advocate for assisted living communities with memory care attached to them that have maybe like little cottages where, you know, most of us live in a single family home. We don't want to move into an apartment in the inside a building. Like that is not my idea of how I want to live, but 
on the flip side of that coin, I'm also always advocating that when we get into our 80s, why in God's name do we want to worry about yard maintenance, whether we're doing it ourselves, which hopefully at 80 something we're not, but we're managing the people who are, you know, cooking, cleaning, or managing somebody who's coming in to clean the house. And I don't care if you have somebody every week, you still need to do stuff, especially if you have dogs like me. You know, cooking is a lot of work. And, you know, if you've been, you know, you're the wife and you've been doing it for 40 or 50 years, you know, part of retirement is giving that over to somebody else. And I I try to sell assisted living and memory care as, you know, kind of the ultimate retirement plan because you can decide what you want to do for yourself. Like my mom decided what she wanted to do for herself, even though she had advanced Alzheimer's. But, you know, I can get into why... I chose not to move mom to my house was a lot of a lot of what you've touched on. But one, it was never a conversation with me. It was just assumed. (laughs) And literally, my daughter moved out of the house February 1st, 2017, and my dad died March 2nd. So I didn't even technically have a month of empty nest before I would have had to move my mom in. My husband and I are both self-employed, so we would have had to hire somebody to come in like you did. And I was looking at, you know, my mom was 74. She could easily have lived, you know, 10 to 15 years because, you know, the only thing that was wrong with her was the Alzheimer's. And it just, when she spent the night at my house, when my dad was in the hospital, she just got so confused. She'd open the bedroom door and let her dog out. And then the dog would lake all over my carpet, which My dogs hated her dog, so there was also an issue. But I'm like, you know, I was like, I just turned 50. The kid finally moved out. She was 25. So, you know, we were um, a little little late on that one, but she's almost 31. She's never boomeranged. So it was a, it was, it was good. But I'm like, I am entitled to have a life. I am entitled to travel. I am entitled to work and not be disrupted continuously with questions from a care person or my mom or both or dealing with her dog or my dog hiding from her dog. I was just like, this is just not going to work. And I knew even though my mom and I had a pretty decent relationship, I knew at the end of, by the end of the first week, one or both of us would be dead because I just couldn't deal with it. I, she pushed all my buttons and I, I just, I did not have the knowledge that I have now from talking to people like you and, you know, over 200 different caregivers and experts. So now I know a lot of stuff that might have changed my mind back then. I don't know. If I had known it was three years, the qualified maybe. But my mom had friends in memory care. My mom did activities that she refused to do with me. And, you know, for the most part, she was happy after after her transition adjustment time. The first five, six weeks were not at all fun. They were not smooth. Like, I think you're the first person I've ever heard that moving them (laughs) was not an absolute total nightmare. So, you know, we might have to talk a little bit about that one as well. But how old were your your oldest two kids when you moved mom in? So let's see. Um, They were (laughs) six and four. Mm. Six and four, um, when they, when I, when I moved my mom in and, um, I mean, it was, it was really nice for them to be able to have that, that time with her. Um, my oldest child is the only one who has any memory of my mom before she really started losing her memory. Um, and, but it was you know, it was sweet. And my mom actually helped. Uh, we, we painted like a flower mural in their bedroom. And my daughter still remembers doing that with my mom. Um, and it was, it was really great to have her there with, with my kids. And then after I had my son, uh, she, that was, that was the point when I realized that she needed to be in full-time care. And I mean, of course I did feel, I feel guilty about it for sure. I don't think that you can make that decision without 
without feeling any sort of guilt. But I, I have a couple of things that people should think about if they are feeling guilty about it. And, and the first thing is, if your parent is living alone and you're debating whether to you know, move that parent into care or keep them in their own house, you know, if, first of all, if their house is not set up for them to age in place, you know, if they're having to go up to a second story bedroom, if the bathroom is not, you know, accessible for them to get in and out of easily, if there's a large yard to maintain, if there's a large house to maintain, that's just not a good place for your parent to be. It's not end of story. It's not safe. But the the the, the, the big issue there is isolation. Mm-hmm. It is not good for older adults to be living alone because that will only hasten their decline. You know, and even if you think, oh, well, it's not too bad. You know, I'll have someone come in. Well, if they're starting to wander at night, who's there at night to make sure your parent isn't wandering out? You know, and the other issue too is that if you've just got one caregiver who's coming in, you're hiring someone so your parent can stay in the home, who's keeping tabs on that caregiver? What happens when that caregiver's sick and there's no one there as a backup? Do you take off a few days of work if you're living in another state? That's really hard. You're going to have to fly and leave your family alone while you go care for mom or dad. Um, but it's, I, I, I hate to scare people about this, but you know, elder financial abuse is certainly an issue. And yes, you can run background checks or if you've got an agency that's running background checks, but you just don't know. And that person could be manipulating your parent, talking your parent into changing their power of attorney designation so that that person can be named power of attorney and they can start, (laughs) you know, stealing money from your parent. They could be stealing things from the parent's home. I mean, if you're going to bring a caregiver in, you've got to get anything that's of value out of the home. All those financial documents need to be locked away someplace safe to protect your parent financially. But there are no checks and balances there. If there is, if your parent is alone, and there's a caregiver coming in. And so there is that benefit of a facility because you've got lots of people there, lots of eyes on your parent at all time, lots of eyes on the other people working, their cameras there. I I like that. I really like that about assisted living facilities and memory care facilities because there are a lot of people there keeping eyes on your parent. You know, I think people also feel guilty because they think, well, if I am having to rely on paid care, if I'm having to put my parent in a facility, that means I couldn't do the job I was supposed to do. I'm supposed to be the one taking care of my parent, but I want you to think about it this way. And I told this to a friend of mine whose mom is struggling to care for her husband. Would would you send your parent to a hospital where the nurses and doctors aren't trained? No, you would never do that. Never in a hundred years, but yet you're not trained to nope. get to bathe your parent. You're not trained to get your parent dressed. You're not trained to do all of these really difficult things that your parent is going to require as that dementia progresses. In facilities, those paid caregivers, they are trained, you know, and oftentimes these facilities will have nurses on call, doctors on call people who can be there, who can provide your parents with, you know, the medical care that they need. You're not trained to do that. And trust me, your parent is going to respond better to someone else telling you to Mm -hmm. do these things than they are to you. Because I watched (laughs) that, you know, my mom was much more responsive to the caregivers in the facility where she was than she was to me because it was her daughter. And there's that role reversal. You know, and once she was in a facility, I could be her daughter again. And that made my relationship with my mom so much better and I can enjoy my time with her and she could enjoy her time with me. It took away that tension that was there because I wasn't having to tell her what to do anymore. And so these are things that you should keep in mind when you're deciding whether to move a parent and when you're feeling that guilt. You were talking about eyes on your parent or your loved one. I guess we're mostly, we're mostly talking about moving parents into a memory care community, but I also know wives caring for husbands, you know, so they're obviously maybe only a little bit younger and they're exhausted physically, mentally, you know, and you're in your eighties, you're like, you know, that kind of care is not, you know, you wouldn't go and hire an 85 year old 
nurse or caregiver to take care of your six foot tall husband because that would be dumb. <laughs> Let's just put it bluntly. And it's it's even more of a challenge because now you have to maintain a household for the person who was the caregiver. You know, you, it's it, the my experience so far is all it's always been the wife. Like my husband is a foot taller than me. Like there are a lot of things I would not be able to do for him. So you you have to think about your own physical capabilities as well. And don't and I always tell people, do not promise them that you will not do something because you have no idea what the future is gonna hold. Like I I, I use this comment all the time. My mom had Alzheimer's for 20 years. So this is 2022. I want you to tell me what 2040, 2042 will look like. You know, where are we going to be at, in this country, in this world? You know, like, what's it going to look like? I have no idea. And if you have an idea, feel free to fill me in. But most people are lucky if they know what next week's going to look like. So do not make promises. Because, unless your crystal ball is perfect, don't make promises. But one of the things, and I said this, my mom had friends in memory care. I will never forget the day that I was taking my mom to get her nails done. She was still kind of, we were, I was at the stage where it was easy enough to continue with the um, acrylic nails. And I wanted mom to look as nice as possible, which is not, a, is not a bad feeling, but sometimes I wonder if all that effort was really worth it. And we did eventually stop that, but her friend wanted to come with us. And I'm like, Oh, okay. My mom's like, yeah, let's, let's bring her along. And I'm like, I don't think I can say no. So I'm like, okay, that's fine. And literally because I had such a good relationship with other residents and the staff, they're like, oh, okay, you're going to take so-and-so with you. That's great. And then like before we were out the door, but just barely, she's like, oh crap, I better call their family. <laughs> and it was like, Oh, yeah, I guess it's probably a good idea. So they have, I mean, like, I'm not authorized to take their loved one anywhere, you know, the nail shop or anything. And we, I took, so I took one of the, my mom was one of three Dianes, as that was not at all confusing at all. But one of them, she was, both of them were very ambulatory, my mom and the other Diane. And we'd go out to the regional park and, they would talk about trees for 30 minutes, the same tree. They would just have the same conversation over. And it was easier because they talked to each other and they rambled on about the same stuff to each other. And then I could just interject or just appreciate their, you know, wacky conversation about trees. You know, like they're literally talking about the bark on a tree. I'm like, okay, God, forgive me, but oh boy, this is going to be a tough one. And I could provide joy and pleasure for my mom and another resident. And I always thought of myself as the captain of mom's care team because the people that worked at that community were not there for me. You know, if I needed something out of one of the locked, you know, the locked vanity in mom's bathroom or, you know, in her room because they locked up all the, you know, uh, toiletries, which was really annoying when you had to get to the toilet paper. But some of the residents, you know, might have drank the shampoo or something yucky. And I could never imagine my mom doing that. I did ask them if they'd give me a key, which they refused, which was annoying. But these were the rules. But, you know, it's just there was just things I could do for them and the residents that added to what the staff did. And I never asked the staff to do stuff for me. You know, it's like if I wanted hot tea for mom and I, I went and made it. If I, you know, had a, if I had a need, I asked them as an, can, can you help me do X? And I always thought that was important because I saw a lot of family members be just very demanding, um, kind of the attitude of, you know, we're paying a lot of money for this place, so you should fill in the blank. And it was just like, you know, you're going to leave and these people are still going to be with your loved ones, so maybe you shouldn't treat them like dirt because that's a really bad idea um you know like i said mom's mom had in an industry with high turnover there was people there that that were there the entire time my mom was there and some of them were there my mom passed away at the beginning of the pandemic so march 31st i went back a couple days before halloween 2020 and i delivered treats and handmade greeting cards to all the residents in the memory care so i got to see who was left and kind of catch up but it's all changed at this point now. It's like two years later. 
And it's, there's just, when you talked about going back to being your mom's daughter, I think that's one of the most important things is you can go back to the relationship that you, that you had spouse, you know, daughter, son, whatever. And you can work on their quality of life better than when you're just constantly trying to like maintain them and care for them. And you said right. your kids were four and six and then the new one. <laughs> I do think you were a little nuts on that one. (laughs) One of the things that I've witnessed is younger children can be really good caregiving aides. They can entertain grandma when you're about to pull out your hair because you've, you know, done the same goofy thing or answered the same question 15 times. They just seem to connect on a different level, you know, and it's like, it's, I'm sure it's hard. And I, kind of experienced this and my daughter was an adult my mom my mom we visited my mom early on in the when she just recently moved in so it was my me my daughter and my paternal grandmother and my mom wailed and cried so hard my daughter never went back to the memory care residence she did spend time with my mom just not there my grandmother didn't go back either so (laughs) it was that traumatic but when she spent time with my mom, like at my house or whatever we were doing at the park, you know, it was fine. And she may have gone back to the memory care one time, but it just, she was really traumatized. And I think not, I sometimes worry that not getting past that was a, not a good thing for my daughter, but like I said, she was an adult, so I wasn't going to push, but People are afraid that little kids will get traumatized. And I, I think that they don't because they connect on this level that we just don't quite get. And I'm assuming your kids probably helped out kind of not a lot. I mean, as much as four and six could. Now we're going to take a quick break for an ad. These ads help me continue to bring the show to you for free. When I learned that despite eating as healthy as possible, we can still have undernourished brains I was frustrated. I also live in a farming community, so I'm aware that our food isn't grown as well as we need. Learning about NeuroReserves, Relevate, and how it's formulated to fix this problem convinced me to give them a try. Now I know many of you are skeptical, as was I. However, I know it's working because of one simple change. My sweet tooth is gone. I didn't expect that, and it's not something other users have commented on, but here's some truth. My brain always wanted something sweet. Now fruit usually did the trick, but not always. One bad night's sleep would fire up my sugar cravings so much they were almost impossible to ignore. You ever have your brain screaming for a donut? Well, for me, those days are gone. It's been about six months since I started taking the supplement and I have no regrets. I believe in my results so much that I'm passing on my 15% discount to you. Try it for two or three months and see if you have a miraculous sweet tooth cure or maybe just better focus and clarity. It's definitely worth a try. Now back to our conversation. I mean, they would do, they would do crafts with my mom and she would sit on the floor and play with toys with them. And I mean, I don't, you know, they've never complained to me about any Neg- anything negative that they experienced from the situation. They went with me often when I would visit her in both of the facilities. Actually, it was my youngest. Once I moved my mom back into the town where I live, it was usually my youngest who would be with me. You know, his sisters would be in school and after school activities. So he'd have to tag along for the ride when I would go visit her before I picked up my daughters and stuff. And um, they, The residents there loved seeing this little kid, just loved it. They would ooh and ah all over him. My mom, too, would get, you know, really excited. She she had no idea it was her grandson, but she just loved seeing a small child. She loved kids. She was a preschool teacher for years. And so, I mean, that was that was a great experience for them. And, you know, in addition Mm -hmm. to my son being able to see her, you know, and he knew, you know, as, as soon as he could understand what was going on that, you know, his grandmother had issues with her memory and couldn't remember things. And, you know, we didn't keep it a secret from him or try to, to, to cover it up in any way. And we were just very honest with my kids. And so, 
um, I don't think they experienced any sort of negative outcomes from their interaction at all. So. Well, my mom certainly would have benefited from both of my parents going to assisted living um, because I think my dad, with his chronic illnesses, I think taking care of her just, I think he just, I think he just mentally burned out and he was on so many different medications. They kept giving him a new one for every new side effect. So you take a new medicine, there'd be a side effect. Then they give another new medicine. It was just ridiculous. And so I'm, I'm a tiny bit, I'm not anti-pharmaceuticals, but I'm close. Like as few as possible is my life's goal. But, you know, I think it would have benefited him I know it would have benefited her because it was such a change. And we did the same thing you did. We moved in all of her bedroom furniture down the hall in the house my sister and I grew up in were all these family photos. So we put those all over the wall. I mean, we made it as much like her house in one room as physically possible. But it just, it was just awful. I mean, she just acted like we were you know, throwing her out with the trash. It was, it was really, really awful. And I've talked to people and they say, you know, the longer you wait, the harder it is, which I believe, but I didn't have control until after my dad was gone. So I will never know if that was an option, but what were the, um, you said, so you had your youngest child and mom was progressing. So what was it that, was it one thing that, made you decide it was time or was it just a lot of little things that built up that you were like, hey, I think we need to do something different. It was, it was those series of events that I mentioned, the, the wandering around <laughs> at night, the, you know, leaving the, the, the kettle on the, the stove, um, just, you know, afraid that she was going to start having issues going up and down the stairs, wandering and getting lost. I mean, obviously I can't lock her in an apartment. That's a hazard in and of itself. And so, you know, and uh, the other thing, too, was that I would find by the end of the day after work and dealing with issues with my mom, because there were more and more mis issues that were cropping up every day, that I was incredibly short tempered with my kids. Mm. And I didn't want to be that kind of mom, to my kids. And I knew that that they had to take priority. And I know my mom would have felt the same way, you know, because we my sister and I were her priority. And so, you know, I just, I had to do what was best for my family overall. And, you know, I certainly, I certainly get the guilt. And I know, like you said, it was very difficult. Your mom was very resistant. I was lucky that my mom was not. She was, she was just a very easygoing person <laughs> to, to begin with. But um, I think the guilt that you feel by moving your parent into a facility is would truly be much less than if something were to happen to your parent and That's you knew an it was point. your fault by not taking action soon enough. I mean, I can't imagine how horrible I would have felt if my mom had walked out during the night and she was injured or worse. That would have been on me forever, knowing that I hadn't acted soon enough to put her into a safe and secure facility. Um, I mean, that's, that's, that's the type of guilt that doesn't go away. <laughs> that, that's true. You feel bad for a little while. If your mom is like, I can't believe you moved in, me into a facility, but she's going to get over it. Like she, she will, she will, she will get over it. She will forget. I mean, that's, nope. that's, that is, that's the beauty of Alzheimer's. There's not much beautiful about that disease, but you know, <laughs> your mom's going to, or your dad will forget <laughs> that they're angry at you after a while. If you've moved him into a facility. And so you have to just remember that you have to tell yourself, you know, it's, this is rough now. I hate doing this, but the alternative could be worse. And yes, my parents will forget what time that yeah. they're mad with me and they'll move on. So you just, I mean, really it's about doing what's best for your parent and your parent might tell you again and again, don't move me into a facility, but that might not be the best thing. I mean, we don't hesitate to do it with our kids. We, we punish our kids when they do something wrong and we know they're going to be mad about it, but we know as a parent, that's what we have to do. And we have to think about that with our own parents. We have to do what's best with them. And it's not always what's best for them, but it's, it's not always easy. It's not easy for them. It's not easy for us. But at the end of the day, we have to do what's best for them and leaving them at home 
or even having them in our homes is not always what's best and they need to get the care they deserve. Yeah, exactly. I knew I would just be, I was, I was not cut out to be full-time caregiver to my mom. I did not want to be. And I also knew that despite having a single story house, it was very large and spread out. We backed up to open space that I don't think she would have wandered out to, but you know, she would have, it would have been, it was open space, but it wasn't flat and there was lots of squirrel holes and snake holes. So, you know, you might go out walking in the, in the tall weedy grass in the spring cause it would look nice and step in a hole and break a leg. That wouldn't have been terribly fun. And the other thing too, is we had a gas range in the kitchen that you could literally just kind of lean, you know, lean a hip on if you're chatting with somebody in the kitchen and the, the burners came on and I thought, how would I, what would I have to do? Like take the knobs off every time I'm done with the stove. I'm like, you know, when I started looking around at my house, cause while my dad was in the hospital before he went on hospice, she was with us for two or three days at a time. And so I got little, well, maybe kind of big, big nuggets of, of the issues that would be there. You know, her dog was one of them. And her confusion of not being in her own home. They, my parents had been in that house literally two months shy of 47 years. So she relied on muscle memory far more than I was aware of. Because once she was out of her house, it was almost like she progressed really fast. But I knew that wasn't, that wasn't what it was. I just knew she didn't have those, those muscle memory. So that was kind of wild to experience. But I was just like... You know, it just, it was so hard just for the two or three days that she was there because you couldn't just sit down and watch a TV show because she couldn't track with them. She couldn't follow them. And so she would wander and talk through them. And you're like, lady, I just want to relax. It's been a busy day. You know, like you're a lot. The clients are a lot. Your dog is a lot. You're like, I just, I just want to like relax and watch some, you know, what was it? I like to watch the, you know, like the cop shows and stuff. I'm not a reality TV person, but you know, and then you also have to think that they can't understand that, you know, if you're watching, you know, law and order SVU and they're talking about rape victims, they don't know that that's not real life. So, you know, like you probably wouldn't watch that show in front of your four year old. You really don't want to watch it with your mom. Who's got memory issues because you don't know how they'll process it. So it's just, it was just like never, ever being off the clock. You know, I'd hear her get up in the middle of the night, like you were saying, and I thought, oh, crap, she's letting the damn dog out in the hallway. And now I'm going to have to wake up for the dog could puddle as much as my golden retrievers. And she was a poodle. That was just like, you know, the dog is going to wreck the house. I'm not sure. my, You know, it's like and my mom wandered around because nothing was hers. I mean, we'd obviously would have made it more her, <clears throat> but it was <clears throat> excuse me. I had a dry throat all morning, <laughs> but it just. It was just very obvious, very fast that it would have been a very bad decision. And I I just knew. And I'm like, I am entitled to not have to supervise her anymore, to not have to worry about her all the time. Because when somebody's got Alzheimer's for almost 20 years, you know, at that point, we're like, you know, going on year 17. <sighs> I'd already been through a lot. And I'm just like, I'm just not doing it. I just I I deserve to have a life. I've worked very hard my whole life. I was 16. And, you know, sometimes I feel like, man, that seems so selfish, but I know it was the right choice. So I, I, I like these kind of conversations because I feel like, you know, people think, well, it's, you know, it's, we've made some adjustments. You know, I have somebody driving mom around and now I have a caregiver that's closer to her age. And well, now we'll just move her into her house. And the next thing you know, you're up to your eyeballs and holy crap, how did I get here? And so I like to have these conversations so that maybe we can help people avoid that moment of, you know, holy crap, I don't have my own life anymore. And that is a lot of times what happens when you're caregiving, you know, and it all depends on the, your loved one's personality and how their disease progresses. You just don't know. I mean, it, sometimes I think, you know, geez, if I know my mom was only going to live three years, maybe I should have moved her into my house. But she probably wouldn't have not moved in or not. She would have lived longer. Maybe I might have killed her. 
But <laughs> the reason that she broke her leg is because she was resisting the care staff. They told me that she reached for her clothes after a shower and slipped. And I'm like, okay, you can tell me that. But I knew her for, you know, 53 years. So <laughs> um, <laughs> I know what she did is she went and jerked away from them and reached for her clothes. And when you fling your body one direction, when you're damp on a tile floor and, you know, you're you've got Alzheimer's, even if you don't have Alzheimer's, it's really not a wise idea because you're just putting yourself at risk. And she broke her leg and that was March 8th and she passed away March 31st. So, you know, it was it was a blessing and but it was still hard. And one of the things that I wish because you said now you're in Kentucky, I'm in California. We don't have communities that have doctors, or at least none that I am aware of, that have doctors and nurses come in, which that has to change. Because taking my mom to the doctor, the biggest pain in the butt, and the biggest nightmare, and the doctor knew nothing about Alzheimer's and didn't seem terribly interested in learning, though I did want to help him by pounding it into his head. He was a really nice guy, but he just was useless when it came to my mom. Which was frustrating because it's like, if you were a jerk, this would be easier to hate you. But anyway, I talk about him a lot because it was really frustrating. Um, but, you know, the staff that are there to take care of and love on your your loved one and be part of the team, they don't get paid enough. My mom had people that took excellent care of her after working a full-time shift at Starbucks. So they would work 16 hours a day. And they still didn't have a lot of money. You know, they didn't have a lot of dollar bills to rub together at the end of the month. And that really, really frustrated me because it was, it was a really hard job. And even the executive director that I was very close with where mom lived, I don't think he was making, you know, he wasn't rolling in it either. I mean, he had a Honda Accord that wasn't brand new and, you know, he didn't have any outward signs of breaking in the big dollars, even though, man, that had to be the most frustrating job on the planet. Please the residents, please the family, please your staff. Oh my God. No, thank you. <laughs> um, and it's just so expensive that people, some people just, you know, they cannot afford it. And I would really like to find a way to make that an option for more people. Cause we're going to need more people are going to need it. So I don't know. It is. Yeah. The cost is certainly an issue. And so that's why it's important to, you know, plan in advance, um, have conversations with your parents, find out what sort of planning they've done. You know, if you're older yourself, you know, thinking, you know, realizing that there's a very high chance that you will need this sort of care and looking into ways to pay for care. It's really important. I mean, Medicaid will pay for certain types of long-term care. Medicare does not. And so, you know, Planning is key. Having these conversations is key. Um, you know, and if and if you can afford it, I I am certainly an advocate of memory care facilities. Me too, because I got to take. You said your the residents love to see your youngest child. That is what my mom and I did. My mom and I went to the park and the pool and the library and watched kids. <laughs> it was a challenge to get her in and out of the car. And from point A to point B in the park, because she walked very slowly behind me, watching her feet, very stressful to get from point A to point B. After she broke her leg, I was like, I am fine with the wheelchair. I know how to transfer people in and out. I will learn, you know, make sure that my skills are top notch. And I will find ways to convince her that me moving her around is OK. We will get from point A to point B in the park a reasonable amount of time and I won't have to worry about her falling on her face. <laughs> and of course, this was right at the start of the pandemic. So I didn't see her the last two weeks of her life. And when they called and said that, you know, mom wasn't doing so great. They thought I would benefit from or she would benefit from a visit from me. And I walked in and I was like, yeah, we're not going to be doing any of this stuff. This is not going where I thought it was. So that was a little bit hard, but I feel very blessed that I did get to see her right the day before she died. They did let there ended up being 10 of us outside her room on March 31st, 2020, the date, which was the day she died. And the poor executive director was very obviously trying not to have a coronary and not ask us to please get the hell out of the building. <laughs> 
So it was it was it was a very interesting experience, and I feel very blessed that they allowed us to do that because I know a lot of people didn't have that. You know, so don't assume that all memory care communities are horrible. They're not like the old nursing homes that we think of. I mean, I've, I never had any of those to really deal with, so I don't have a lot of firsthand experience of those, but I, I, I've heard enough stories, you know. There, there are plenty of wonderful facilities out there, so I agree. You know, have your parents look into it, look into it yourself, have a plan, and, and um, you know, try to get past the guilt. That would be my message overall. Yeah, guilt isn't going to do you any good just going to eat away at you and it's not good for your brain. It's not good for your soul. You know, you just have to keep saying, I know I'm doing the right thing for everybody because if you only do the right thing for your parent or you're only doing the right thing for your children, you know, if you're only doing the right thing for your children, you might be neglecting your spouse. That's not good. That's just a non Alzheimer's relationship. But now you've got other people involved. Oh my gosh. It's just, <laughs> My husband and I are in our mid fifties, getting closer to the. He'll be fifty eight this year. I'll be fifty six. So, the mid is starting to get in the rearview mirror, and it's like, I get really worried because it's like this is you know we have to make some improvements to this stuff, people, because you know I plan to live to be at least one hundred and three, like my paternal grandmother. I do do everything I can to avoid Alzheimer's, but this is a two story house. My office and my my special craft room all downstairs right here with me. You know, if I can't get down the stairs because I have crappy knees already, you know, I guess, I don't know. I'll have to take over the dining room or something. <laughs> it's like, you got it. You got to have a plan. <laughs> yeah, well, we do. It It is my, when we were buying this house because I really wish developers would freaking build more single story homes. My husband is a real estate broker. Trust me, they would sell. So if you're listening, developers... Trust me, they'll sell. People always want them. Very few people actually want two story. Most people just, you know, because they're not as big an option out here because land is so cheap in California. <laughs> you know, it, people just choose what they like and then they don't think about it. But we did. And when we couldn't find a single story, my husband told the broker we were working with that, well, this will be our last house till we die or have to move to assisted living. And if I could have done a cartwheel, on the deck, I would have, but I knew that that would probably not be good for me. <laughs> so, because again, as I mentioned earlier, you know, we have a landscaper. We kind of sort of have a housekeeper, but I think we're going to have to do more of that ourselves at this point. You know, my husband is on crutches right now because he's got an open wound on his foot that because he's got neuropathy from prediabetes, didn't realize that it was a problem. And I finally said, you need to go to a podiatrist. And he did. And now he can't put any pressure on that foot. So there's more responsibilities for me. And it's just like, I don't want to have to do all this stuff 30 years from now. So somebody else can do it. <laughs> I finally convinced the, at least the most important person in my life. That is what we're going to be considering when we're, when we are in our eighties, Blah. <laughs> tongue twister right here at the end. So Cameron is the author of Hey Mom, Dad, We Need to Talk. It's an excellent book. It's kind of a workbook to help you get into these challenging conversations. We did a whole episode on that. It is linked in the episode notes. So if you haven't heard it, go back and listen to that one too. And you know what? If it's too late to have those conversations with your parents, start having these conversations with your kids because that's also in the book. Do you have a last tip for us before I let you run off into your day? Because I know you have 103 things to do like the rest of the world. <laughs> <laughs> a little kid to pick up from school and take to the orthodontist. Um, no fun. <laughs> you know, really it is. It's just, it's about, it, it comes down to, you know, having these conversations, planning, trying to let go of the guilt, um, and really just doing what's best for your parents and for your own situation. Yep. You got to consider both. Well, I appreciate this tremendously. This has been so much fun. Um, I am going to also link two episodes that I did with Experiences in Caregiving podcast where we talk about how to choose memory care because I was the poster child for probably how not to do it. I pretty much used gut instinct. And when they said they 
would keep mom's dog with her. I basically threw money at them. <laughs> so Cameron did more research than I did, I'm sure. So. <laughs> <laughs> but it all came out OK. So I will link those as well so that you guys can have a really robust listening experience on this topic. And I thank Cameron very much. And we'll probably have her back some other time, maybe to talk about finan elder financial scams. Oh, that's a good one. <laughs> <laughs> that's, well, thank, that's, <laughs> thank you so much. Fading Memories is also available wherever you get your favorite podcasts.